stairs go? They go up. C is a low level language. It didn't used to be. Back in punch card days, C was an incredible way to be free of the drudgery of lower level languages, like assembly. But now, in these modern times, current generation languages offer all kinds of features that didn't exist in 1972, when C was invented. This means C is a pretty basic language with not a lot of features. It can do anything, but it can make you work for it. So why would we even use it today? First of all, as a fantastic learning tool. Not only C is a venerable piece of computing history, but it is connected to the verb metal in a way that present day languages are not. When you learn C, you learn about how software interfaces with computer memory at a very low level. There are no seat belts. Believe me, you'll write software that crashes, I assure you. What do I mean with C being tied to the metal? Well, here I prepared a very simple program. Don't worry if you don't understand what is going on by now. Just ponder the overall principle, the overall idea of what you can do with C. Basically, we have a string, which is just a series of charts, H-E-L-L-O, world. As you can see, we have uppercase charts and lowercase charts. Then we print this original string. We apply a certain function, which is called lower, that takes as an input the actual string. And then we print again the string. First of all, let's run the code. So this is the command to run C code. Basically, we have a compilation, namely a translation of C code into an executable. We will see all about that. And then I simply run. As you can see, we managed to convert our string in a lowercase string. Basically, all the uppercase chars have been converted to lowercase. Now, the function lower basically is looping inside all the chars of the string hello world. And if the char pointed is in uppercase, I'm gonna turn on one specific bit. Basically, I'm accessing one bit in memory. I can do that in C with this bitwise operator. Amazing, right? You have such a refined control over memory. Now, let me give you a TLDR explanation of what is going on. Basically, every char underneath the hood is just a number. In this case, uppercase A is the number 65. If you want to look up, just search for ASCII code. This is just a mapping between numbers and symbols. Because at the end of the day, inside computers, you only have numbers. Or better said, you have binary numbers. So the number 65 is this bit pattern. You have 01000001. It did, it comes from the sum of 64 plus 1. Following the logic, you have the uppercase B, which has the value 66, and this bit configuration, C is 67, D is 68, and you got the gist of it, right? Now let's go back to A and pay attention to this pattern. As you can see, the least significant bit is turned on. Now, if you watch the configuration for lowercase a, you see that we have a similar pattern, but we have the quote unquote prefix bits different, right? The thing is that we have 26 in the alphabet, so five bits are totally enough to represent all of them. Indeed, I have 32 possibilities with five bits, 32 patterns. So five bits are used to represent the actual letter of the alphabet, indeed the position of the letter in the alphabet. As you can see, A has the value one. The only difference between uppercase and lowercase are the quote unquote prefix bits, which are the first three. This was a marvelous idea. Indeed, it's very simple to extrapolate the letter of the alphabet just from the bit pattern. Now the thing I'm trying to do, well, if I want to convert whatever uppercase letter in a lowercase letter, I just have to turn on the third bit, right? That's the only difference. Of course, this is an hacky way of doing things. You can simply add 32. You can say 65 plus 42 equal 97. But here I just wanted to show you the hacky things you can do having such a low level access. Cool, right? A second reason is because C is a useful tool. Indeed, C is still used for certain applications, such as building operating systems, or in embedded systems. If you are familiar with another language, a lot of things about C are easy. C inspired many other languages like Go, Rust, Swift, Python, JavaScript, Java, and all kinds of other languages. The one thing about C that angs people up is pointers. 
Virtually everything else is familiar, but pointers are the weird one. Once you grok pointers, they're suddenly easy, but up until that moment, they're slippery hills. Everything else in C is just memorizing another way, or sometimes the same way of doing something you have already done. So get ready for an adventure as close to the core of the computer as you can get without assembly, in the most influential computer language of all time. This is the canonical example of a C program, everyone uses it. We're going to grab a scalpel and rip into this thing to see what makes it thick. Anything between the digraph slash star and star slash is a comment and will be completely ignored by the compiler. Same goes for anything on a line after a double slash. This allows you to leave messages to yourself and others so that when you come back and read your code in a distant future, you will know what the heck you were trying to do. Believe me, you will forget. It happens all the times. Ash include. Well, it tells the C preprocessor to pull the contents of another file and insert it into the code right there. Wait, 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 wait. What's a C preprocessor? That's a good question. Well, compilation, namely the translation of a C program into binary code that it can actually run into a CPU, has many stages. Later I will explain much better these compilation stages. By now you just have to know that the preprocessor is just a program that performs one step of the compilation. Namely, anything that starts with the pound sign, or octothorf, as it is called. It's something that the preprocessor operates on before the compiler even gets started. Common preprocessor directives, as they are called, are the ash include or ash define. Again, more on that later. After the C preprocessor has finished preprocessing everything, the results are ready for the compiler to take them and produce assembly code, machine code, or whatever it's about to do. Machine code is the actual language the CPU understands, and it can understand it very rapidly. So again, don't worry about the technical details of compilation for now. Just know that your source runs through the preprocessor then the output of that runs through the compiler, then that produces an executable for you to run. What's this angle brackets stdo.h? That is what is known as a nether file. It's the dot h at the end that gives it away. In fact, is the standard input output header file that you will know very well because you're gonna use basically on all your C programs. Indeed, it gives you access to a bunch of input output functionalities. For our very simple hello program, we are outputting the string hello world. So we in particular need access to the printf function to do this. Indeed, the standard input output header file gives us this access. Basically, if we try to use printf without dash include stdo.h, the compiler would have complained to us about it. How did I know I needed to include stdo.h for printf? Answer, it's in the documentation. If you are on a Unix system, man3 printf, and it will tell you right at the top of the man page what other files are required. The next line is main with round braces. This is the main function. Everything between the squirrely braces is the body of the function. Now, the main function is a special one in many ways, but one way stands above the rest. It is the function that will be called automatically when your program starts executing. Nothing of yours gets called before the main. In the case of our example, this works fine since all we want to do is print, align and exit. Oh, that's another thing. Once the program executes past the end of main, down there at the closing squirrel braces, the program will exit and you'll be back at your command prompt. So by now we know that this program has brought in another file, which is a standard input output file, and declared a main function that will execute when the program is started. So what are the goodies inside the main function? Well, we only have a call to the printf function. You can tell this is a function call and our function definition in a number of ways, but one indicator is the lack of squirrely braces after it. And you end the function call with a semicolon. So the compiler knows it's the end of the expression. You are passing one argument to the function printf, a string to be printed when you call it. Now, what's that crazy backslash n 
at the end of the string. Well, most characters in the string will print out just like they are stored. But there are certain characters that you cannot print on screen that are embedded as two characters backslash codes. One of the most popular is backslash n. Backslash because the top of the slash is pointing backwards. These two character code correspond to a new line character. This is just a character that causes further printing to continue at the beginning of the next line instead of the current one. It's like eating return at the end of the line. So now that we have this program, let's just run it to see what is going on. Now I find myself into a Linux virtual machine. So if you are on a Unix like platform from the command line, you'll build with a command like this, namely GCC dash O hello and the input file, which is hello.c. This simply means compile hello.c and output an executable called hello. So I press enter. After that's done, you should have a file called hello that you can run with this command dot slash hello, which is the name of the executable. The leading dot slash tells the shell to run from the current directory. So you press enter now and boom, you have hello world. Perfect, this is your first C application. The C code you write is total gibberish for your computer, for your CPU. Indeed, this is stuff for humans, for us. But your CPU only wants binary, only wants controlled signals. So we need the process, we need a translation of your source C code into something that your CPU can digest. This process is the compilation. Basically, we have your C code that's going to be processed by a compiler, and the most famous one is GCC, GNU Compiler Collection, that is going to transform your C code into an executable. Then the operating system is going to load this into memory, into the actual CPU to be processed. In this video, we are going to discuss superficially what is going on, because compilation is a multi-stage process. Indeed, GCC is a tool chain. We have many sub-processes that are happening underneath the hood. Now, compilation can become really complex if we seek all the details. So I will give you an abstract explanation to understand the overall principles. Then I will give you some suggestions if you want to really dig down on what is going on. So let's be very practical. Let's create a program. So the classic include standard input output, and then we create our function. Easy vanilla, right? Like that. Of course, I have included stdo.h because I want to use the printf function. Now, to run this program, you simply compile, right? gcc hello.c, enter, and you get an executable, which by default is a.out, assembly.out. Then you simply say, a hey, in this current directory, so dot slash, there is a program a.out, you simply enter, and you get your program executed. Hello world. Now let's dissect all the compilation stages. So let me remove a dot out and we start from the first step. The first step is the pre-processing and the result is going to be a dot i file dot intermediate. To do that, we simply bid the command gcc dash e. So the compilation is going to stop to the pre-processing phase. So we do gcc dash e, the source, and then we are going to redirect the output into a file hello.i. Now we have our hello.i file. Let's inspect it. So we get all of this stuff, all of this gibberish, right? And at the very bottom, we get our C program. So you can see that above our C program, a lot of lines have been copied by the preprocessor. Interesting for us is the actual printf prototype. As you can see, there are many kinds of printf, fprintf, sprintf, vfprintf, whatever. What we need in our application is this prototype. A prototype is simply an API of the function. It describes how the function is made, the inputs it takes, the outputs it gives. So what happened? Well, basically this hash include is a preprocessor directive. It's telling this program, the preprocessor, to include, namely embed this stdo.h file at this position. So we have basically a copy passed. Now, conceptually, you have to assume the standard input output header file contains all the input output functions. 
So we have printf, but also scanf, get char, put char, whatever. Now, including this file at the very top of my hello world application, I get an inclusion of all these functions here represented like black box magic. Indeed, the printf is a big function implemented by other programmers that we can use simply including this file. If you want to see how to create a printf function, I made an entire series about that. Just keep in mind that printf is a black box filled with code that we can access with a simple inclusion. To make it clear, there is plenty of other files, for example, math.h, including math.h, you are gonna put inside your application all the functions related to mathematics. This is superficially what happens. Now, interesting to know, you can uh, get the same result as with CPP, which is the name of the preprocessor. So you do again hello.c, which is the source, and the output you're gonna put in, into hello cpp-i, just to make a difference. And you will see that the files are exactly the same. If we do a diff of the two files, you don't get anything because they're exactly equal. Indeed, CPP is the name of the preprocessor. You see, CPP, the C preprocessor. And here you can see that the C preprocessor is a macro processor that is used automatically by the C compiler to transform your program before compilation. And here you get all the jazz of what is going on. Now, after that, we get the actual compilation we jump from a .i file into a .s file. So we have an actual translation from C code into assembly. Assembly is a symbolic representation of the actual machine code. So gcc dash uppercase s, hello dot i, enter. And now we get this assembly code. So hello dot s, as you can see, here we have the actual program. This is already very close to the machine and very difficult for us, right? Because we have these strange commands that we don't understand. We can understand the string hello world at this level and here it's already low level stuff. Now this hello.s is still not an executable. Indeed, this is assembly code. So now we have to assembly this assembly code and to do that, we're gonna use the assembler. So we're gonna do gcc-c and we're gonna get the actual object file. An object file is already a binary file, but it's still not executable. So let's do that, gcc-c hello.s, the source, enter. And now you see that we have an object file. This is already an executable, linkable file, relocatable. So it is already a binary file. Right, you see that we are already in gibberish land. This though is not runnable yet. The final step is the linkage. We can do that simply by using GCC and the list of object files. The final thing we are gonna get is the actual executable, a.out. So GCC, hello, dot o, right? Enter. And now finally we have our executable that we can run like that and everything works. After the linkage, the operating system can load the program into memory and the CPU, and we are done. You see how many steps are happening underneath the hood that you're not aware of. It's a lot of stuff, right? This has been explained very superficially. There's plenty of details. So all of these commands are happening without you noticing. So all of these files are created, but you don't see them, right? If I remove all of these files like that, and I do gcc hello.c, I get my executable, right? Ready to run with no problems. But I can do also like that. I can do gcc save temps hello.c, and you will see that I get all the temporary files that gcc has created underneath the hood. Now for a simple overview, this is totally enough. If you want to dig down, I suggest you this. Remove everything, rem remain only with your hello.c, just check what the compiler is doing. GCC dash hash 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 is gonna tell GCC to show the actual commands that it would do, but don't do them. Save temporaries, the flag to save all the temporary files in your current directory, the source, load.c, and then redirect the standard error in gcc.txt, enter. Now we get this file, and if we cut the file 
and we spec'd it, we will see all the commands that have been run by GCC. So let's search for hello.i. Here we are. So here we get the actual command to create hello.i. Let's copy this and let's launch. As you can see, it's pretty long, filled with details. We see here CC1, right, which is the name of the compiler. We see dash E for the preprocessor. We see here dash O hello.i, which is the actual file. Enter. And now we get the actual preprocessed file, right? If we inspect, we see that is exactly the file we got before with at the very end our C code. Now let's search for hello.s. Here we are. We need to go from hello.i to hello.s. This is the actual command. Copy, paste here. As you can see, we have cc1, which is the name of the compiler. Here a flag preprocessed hello.i, which is the input file. Some other flags, but importantly, the output is going to be hello.s. If we enter and we inspect hello.s, you can see that we have the actual assembly code hello.o. Here we comes the command, this one, this is very short, copy, we're gonna pass, and now we get the actual object file, right, which is this one, a-lo.o. Indeed, we are already in a binary land, right, this is a binary file. Now, the final command is this big boy here, look at that. So let's copy this, and let's launch, boom, now we get our executable, a.out, launch, and hello world. As you can see, the linkage is pretty cumbersome. We have this program, collect2, which basically it's a wrapper for the actual linker. The linker is LD. If you do man LD, you will get the GNU linker, as well as man S, which is just the assembler. So you saw that we have basically the C preprocessor, then we jump into the CC1, the compiler, then the assembler, and then the linker. These are the actual tools used by GCC. Now the thing, how to make sense of all this madness? Well, I suggest you to use AI just to decompose the problem into manageable steps, right? You just feed all of these commands and you try to understand what is going on step by step, line by line, flag by flag, you see? Here I have an embedded AI in my system and here is explaining me what is going on flag by flag if you really want to understand what is going on so you can see that you can go very very deep with this compilation c has come a long way over the years and it had many named version numbers to describe which dialect of the language you're using these generally refer to the here of the specification the most famous are c89 c99 c11 and now C2X. To give you an overview, we have the Kernighan and Ricci C. This is the OG C from 1978, which is the original C. This is named after Brian Kernighan and Dennis Ricci. Ricci designed and coded the language, and Kernighan co-authored the book on it. You rarely see original Kernighan and Ricci code today. If you do, it will look very odd, like Middle English looks odd to modern English readers. Then we have C89 or NCC or C90, all as you want. In 1989, the American National Standards Institute, namely NC, produced a C language specification that set the tone for the C that persists to this day. A year later, the reins were handed to the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, that produces the identical C90. C95, this is a rarely mentioned addition to C89 that included wide character support. C99, this is a big one with a lot of language additions. The thing most people remember is the addition of the double slash comment style. This is the most popular version as I'm recording this video. C11, this major version update includes Unicode support and multi-threading. Be advised that if you start using these language features, you might be sacrificing portability with places that are stuck in C99 land. C17 and C18. Well, this is just a bug fix update to C11. C17 seems to be the official name, but the publication was delayed until 2018. As far as I can tell, these two are interchangeable, with C17 being preferred. C2X. What's coming next? This is the next 
thing. Now to make a practical example, here I have some C programs. Everyone with some specific features depending the dialect, right? Depending the standard. Now this is the classic hello world that you know very well. And I'm gonna compile this with the flag NC for NCC. Enter. I'm very simply gonna run. Everything works perfectly. Now let's open C99. Now in C99 we have uh, an introduction of more features, as you can see. Now you don't have to understand what is going on here. The take home message what is, well, if I compile this with NC as a standard, I will get these complaints. As you can see, I get use option STD C99 to make this work. So I do the same thing, but this time I will change the standard to C99, enter. And this time everything works, right? See, just changing the standard, we're able to use this. Now let's take C11. If I compile with the standard C99, the code for C11, I will get the same complaints, right? I don't have this static assert. On the contrary, if I do standard C11 and I compile, everything works. So you got the gist of it, right? We have different versions of the C language. The compilation I'm gonna use in these videos is this one, GCC standard C2X, the last standard, pedantic, warning all, a warning extra. Basically, this is a good way to compile our codes to get all the warnings necessary. All right, that's the end of the first chapter.